It's Platt, and today we drink the dragon. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So the particular beer we have today is Golden Drock, translates into Golden Dragon. Apparently uh, has something to do with uh, kind of Viking folklore. They would have these dragons on the front of their warship to intimidate people. <laughs> you know, kind of a cool story. As far as the beer itself, the beer is produced by Browery von Steenberg. Browery is Belgium for brewery. The uh, brewery itself is located in Ertville, uh, Belgium, kind of in East Flanders region, northwest uh, Belgium. They claim the brewery was established in 1784, but that's really the first time it's ever mentioned on paper, kind of the first time you could factually say this thing was open. Uh, back then, a lot of these quote-unquote breweries were just farmers who had excess grain, excess whatever, and would just brew some beer mainly for themselves, but they might sell to friends and family. Uh, things weren't necessarily licensed. There wasn't stuff on paper. So this is the first time in 1784 that this brewery was mentioned on paper. Now the farmer in question was a gentleman named John Patiste de Braun. Uh, uh, probably this brewery had been around years before, but like I said, that was the first time it was on paper. When uh, John Patiste died, his uh, wife kept the brewing going on the farm, and eventually uh, their... Uh, Nephew, a gentleman named Joseph Shelblot, hopefully I just said that right, uh, took over the brewing part and eventually kind of took over the farm. He converted one of the barns into a malt house, started growing hops on the farm, and turned it from kind of a family thing, you know, just kind of fun family friend thing into a full commercial enterprise. Now, Joseph's daughter ended up marrying a gentleman named Paul Van Steenberg. That's where the Steenbergs come in, and uh, today the sixth generation of the Steenberg family uh, runs the brewery still or continues in an operational position. Uh, kind of cool story there. Uh, boy, doesn't it seem a lot of time these brewers marry into these breweries. Maybe I need to find me a brewery, brewer's daughter to uh, <laughs> get me a brewery. Um, one of the cool things they did to help get them through uh, two world wars was they sold lemonade. I've talked about here in the States how breweries had to do different things to get through prohibition. Over there they had two world wars to work through so supplies, stuff like that were probably tough. You know, your brewery getting blown up. Uh, but they sold lemonade to help them get through that time which uh, kind of was a cool little story. The brewery took a big step forward in 1978 when they purchased or acquired uh, recipes and yeast strains from the Augustinian monks, apparently they're getting out of the beer business. Um, over the years, we've lost a lot of these Trappist breweries in Belgium. Just the monasteries shrink. They don't have people to do it. They can't kind of keep their tradition. And so in 1978, they picked up, like I said, these recipes and these yeast strains. They didn't just directly turn those into a quote-unquote kind of Trappist beer or anything like that, but they took that knowledge and used it for a yeah, you know, baseline for a series line of the beers they did, including this particular one, Golden Drock. Um, in 1992, they took another big step forward. They completely automated and computerized the entire brewing, uh, the entire brewing system, their uh, their bottling, their fermentation. Uh, if you see pictures of the brewery today, it's ultra modern. Everything's stainless steel. Everything's just really clean. And that was a big deal in Belgium. They were the first to do it. You still today, especially the Trappist breweries, very traditional open air brewing, open wooden vats. Um, they don't even touch the dust there because they allow wild yeast to come in. And this is kind of the opposite of that. But again, kind of kind of cool. And they, they, they kind of brought uh, Belgian brewing into the 21st century. Real quick, let's talk about some of the beers they produce. They don't produce like a Van Steenberg Light or a Van Steenberg Pills or anything. They have lines and then they kind of develop or flesh out those lines. Uh, first is the Baptiste line, named after the farmer that started on, John Baptiste de Braun. Uh, there's a Blonde, a Wit, a Saison, and an IPA. Uh, next is their Pirate line, P-I-R-A-A-T. Interestingly enough, it uses the same wine yeast as uh, Golden Drock. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, besides a regular pirate, there's a pirate triple hop and a pirate red. Uh, I believe they come in similar uh, kind of short squatter bottles. 
Uh, next is the Augustine line, named after the Augustine monks, which they picked up these recipes and yeast from. Uh, there's a blonde, a dark, and a grind crew, which is kind of a blend. And then finally, the Golden Drock line itself. Besides this one, there is a dark imperial stout, a smoked version, and then something they call 9,000 quad. It's their take on a tra Trappist quadruple. That's you know, really big flavorful beer. Uh, definitely a beer I'm going to have to keep an eye out for. Well, before we try this particular beer, though, let's check out stats. So today I thought I'd talk about the concept of using wine yeast in beer, a different type of yeast. Uh, if you don't home brew or you're not familiar with the concept of brewing, uh, you know, some people say, well, isn't yeast just yeast? Well, not really. Uh, probably five or 600 years ago, that was a concept. Uh, people didn't even understand the concept of yeast back then. But in the last couple hundred years with advanced science of we understand that there's different strains and uh, the scientists have bred and genetically engineered these yeast strains. So now you have a beer yeast strain, a wine yeast strain, champagne, distiller's yeast, you know, of course, bread yeast. And um, they all kind of specialize in what they do. Uh, when you brew beer, you use barley and the sugar that gets extracted from barley is maltose. And beer yeast love that. In wine, the sugar that the wine yeast eat, eats is fructose. Now they both can eat the other, you know, they, you know, beer yeast can eat fructose and vice versa, but these yeasts were designed for those things specifically. And when you have an interaction with different sugars and different yeasts and stuff, you'll start to get different flavor compounds. And it's actually kind of a neat way to get a different flavor out of a beer, even though you have the same mash bill. Uh, so it's kind of a cool idea. A few breweries are out there doing this. Uh, I know Brooklyn Brewery does their Sriracha Ace Saison. Uh, Goose Island has their Gillian Farmhouse Ale. And Oma Gang does their, in their Game of Thrones series, it's For the Throne Golden Ale. And I think Dogfish Head has also played around with this concept too. But it's something I might try, you know, next time I brew a batch of beer just to see. Maybe I do a split batch or whatever uh, and see how that works out. But it likes an interesting kind of concept. Well, enough about that. Let's drink the dragon. Oh, that's nice. Now, I'm using a little different glass. This is more of a traditional, the snifter is more kind of a traditional glass for Belgian beers. The Belgians are really into their glassware. Uh, I also like pouring a nice thick head. Oh my gosh, you really get those dark uh, malt notes, dark fruit notes. That's one thing you pick up in Belgian beers a lot of times, a, a, a dark fruit note. Uh, not a lot of hops uh, on the nose or whatever. Generally, the malt bill in a lot of these Belgian beers kind of really uh, take the hop out of there. Let's give her a try. Oh my gosh, that is velvety smooth. Just nice. I Meaning, I'm not gonna say this is a real viscous or, or but it's a big body beer. Oh, that warming's going down, you know, where it where it uh, I believe 10.5%. You notice you feel that going down, but it hurts so good <laughs> good. Um oh my gosh, this this is a wintertime beer. Man, this, I would love to be outside in a campfire on a little cool or on a patio. Um, this is a beer that you sip too. We, we're going to put in this. We're not going to rush through this. We're going to savor the flavors. You're going to let this beer open up. Um, this is not necessarily a beer that you would put in a frosted glass or anything. A little, a little temperature helps. Uh, one of the Silly little things when you sell cognac and snifters is, well, you hold it like this and your, the palm of your hand heats it and opens it up. That's also probably true on this beer, too. I've had this in the fridge, so it's probably a little colder than I would normally serve it. And uh, so, again, the snifter thing, holding it, letting it sit, will just open it up more. But, man, a really good beer. Classic Belgium, you know, higher ABV, just a lot of flavor, not a lot of hops. Uh, big bodied, those dark multi notes, those dark fruit notes. Uh, man, really good. Well, I hope you like this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. 
If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you'd like me to try, please leave me in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Until next time, bottoms up.